to ski fast, okay? So take one minute just now um, to go through it. Kids, ask parents, ask your brothers, your sisters, everything. Um, and we'll, we'll come back in one minute um, with, with just to make sure everyone kind of is on the same page. Okay, so we'll just give you another 30 seconds or so. Alrighty, awesome. So we're gonna get going. Um, the platform. What? What? Firstly, what's the platform? Platform is, is just like we said before. It's everything to do with skiing. It's uh, it's how you balance. It's your position on the skis. Um, it allows you to roll your ankles, which is the next point. Um, that tiny little movement of rolling both your ankles at the same time. Um, and then building upon that, once you've rolled your ankles, your knees move over, which creates your shins to look like window wipers as they both go across. Um, if you're on dry slope, that's all you're going to do. Just roll your ankles and your knees fall. If you're on snow and you have to create that bigger angle like uh, Charlie in the picture here, then your hip moves across as well. So that, that brings in the introduction of the hip. Um, the upper body, we talk about the legs doing something different to the upper body. So the shoulders uh, should always be square, facing down the hill and level as well. So if you have to have a meter stick or a big long uh, gait across the shoulders, it should be level, if anything, leaning to the outside. Um, which in, in part is separation. So having the ability to keep your upper body completely upright, but throw your legs all the way out to the side. Um, so the tech points we've done, the tactical points are line, um, a couple of things. Um, when you pass the gate, you need to be aiming above the next gate. That's the, the bread and butter of the line of ski racing, slalom, uh, whether it's stubbies, uh, little brushes, gates, GS, Super G downhill. Um, course inspection we spoke about looking for areas of rhythm in a slalom course corridors uh, combinations went through hairpins verticales uh, banana gates delay gates under gates um, and, and what to look for on, on race day course inspection we went through an actual race day so your start routine your warm-up routine um, how to prep your skis what to do with your skis and last week we looked at the tuck um, and how to utilize, how to go faster um, on your skis, basically by, by not doing much. Um, so we've got a couple of follow-up questions from last week. Um, how many pairs of skis do athletes need? Good question. Um, I had two pairs of skis until I was second year under 14. Um, and then on the complete other end of the spectrum, um, when we were in Fizz, I think my brother and I probably shared 20 pairs of skis. Um, so it, it, it's completely different it depends firstly what deals you get that there's deals out there um guys you should be writing to you know ski brands local companies everything um to get any help you can whether it be getting skis getting bindings getting tuning kit um so it, it varies depending on on um who the athlete is what age they are what level they're at um does dry slope impact what you can do on snow absolutely a hundred percent um Dave Ryden skied on dry slope until I think about 15, 16. Laurie Taylor was on dry slope. Um, Charlie was on dry slope. I think Tilly might have even been on a dry slope. So all these World Cup guys um, really learned their skills on the dry slope. It's amazing um, for really concentrated training. So the likes of rolling your ankles, the likes of your upper body. Um, 
so yes, dry slope absolutely relates to, to snow. Why do some of the World Cup guys look like they're skidding the turns? It's a good question. Um, a, a couple of reasons. One, on the World Cup, they set the courses sometimes extremely tight in GS. So if you've got a 30 metre radius ski, what does that mean? It means it takes 30 metres for the ski to turn. But the distance between the gates might only be 24 metres. So these guys in the World Cup sometimes steer their feet a little bit um, purely because of that. For all under 10s, 12s, 14s, 16s, and even the younger fizz guys, rolling your ankles, then rolling your knees over is the, is the bread and butter of, of how these guys do it. Um, we're going to come on to that a little bit longer and a little bit later on as well. How much difference does a cat suit make, speed suit? Uh, good question. It makes a fair, a fair bit. Um, if you train, I remember I got a, a shock a couple of times, used to train in a GS pair of salopets and a shell, Salon was just a shell, um, and then you stand in the start gate and all of a sudden you, you think, whoa, I'm flying here, and you really are. So it, it does make a difference. It's worth training in if you've got one. Um, can you practice a tuck off skis? Absolutely. Um, I was going to put this slide up from last week. Um, Again, you want to imagine like that program hole in the wall, like you're going to really break through the plane. Um, you're going to break through that wall as small as you can. The Americans call the tuck the bullet, um, which I, I think is a really good name. We, we sometimes call that the bull or the bullet. Um, if you play Mario Kart, the only reason I'm saying this is because I've been playing Mario Kart uh, a little bit. If you get the, uh, those black bullets when you're in last place, that is literally what you want to do. So what all they do is minimize the surface area at the front. And as a result, they go fast. All right, Mario Kart, you can't beat it. So yeah, the tuck is, is really important. Can you turn in the tuck? Absolutely. Um, so this is one of the Germans, it's, it's Sander in the World Cup. Um, maybe Alex Schmidt actually. And you can see that nothing has changed. So if I zoom in on this picture, that's not what I wanted to do. If I zoom in on this picture, you can see these two lines there. So that's one. And that's two. He's rolled his skis on. The knees have gone in. You can see his, his shins are more or less parallel. Um, and he's managed to hold the tuck. So, so to do that, yeah, it's very difficult. But yes, it, it's absolutely doable. If, you're, if you've got the platform, absolutely doable. If your feet are too close together, likely it is you'll fall over. If your feet are too far apart, you'll have what's called an A-frame. So your, inside, your outside leg, will go in a lot, but your inside knee won't be able to because you, you'd be like John Wayne. So your inside knee goes all the way in, but your, out, uh, your outside knee, sorry, but your inside knee can't. So you get this A shape. Um, so that, that's something to look out for. Parents, really easy to notice. Um, so yeah, coming, coming back to the, the platform, this looks really confusing. Um, this is Luca Diale Prandini, the Italian guy, um, came second at World Champs last week. Um, now, if you look, uh, we're, we're going to ignore this one on the left. If you look at the one on the right, he's at the gate. Now, I, I don't know if I can, yeah, I can zoom in. So, I mean, that, that, firstly, that picture there is phenomenal. His shins are parallel. The distance between the tips of his skis, his feet and his knees are the same. His shoulders are level. If you, what I'm really excited about is this next movement here. So, he uses, he loses the platform a little bit. Um, uh, below the gate at the bottom of the turn, but he fights so hard to get that platform back to make sure that the distance between the tips of his skis, his feet and his knees are exactly the same. Now, if you saw Alexei Pantaro in the GS, uh, he won the first run by, I don't know, about three years. But the second run, he went out at the start and, and fell inside on the seventh gate. If you look at the video, um, I'm sure it's on YouTube or something, he wasn't fighting to get that platform. He, he almost got, not lazy, but he almost accepted that he could get away with it until eventually the ski gave way because he, he had too much weight on the inside ski. So um, I'll email out these slides again. I should have said at the top, I need to apologize for not putting last week's on YouTube. I'll get them both on YouTube um, by the end of this week, 100%. Um, so yeah, these guys, they fight for the platform. That's how they're fast. They fight for the platform every single time. So that's a good GS example. Here's a slalom example. So it looks like Manny Feller, I think. Um, hopefully you can see my cursor. He makes a cross block here. Now, it would have been so easy for him 
to come down and, and almost go over where the top of his head is there. However, he's made the decision to fight to come under this gate, and you can see if there was a, a freeze frame there, he would have a perfect platform to roll on and to come through there. So these guys are constantly fighting, um, you know, for 60, 70 gates in slalom, 40, 50 gates in GS, and, you know, for two and a half minutes in downhill um, to keep that platform, and it's just a fight the whole way down. And if you do it, that's how you fast. Um, it's the guys that lose the platform that uh, are either crashing or, or they're way off the pace. Um, it's like what happened to Dave and Laurie in the World Cup slalom. They were so fast at the beginning because they had that platform. When the speed picked up, they dropped the hips back. Dave had a bad back, but no excuses for Laurie. He dropped his hip back and he, he let his feet get away from him. So we're, we're going to come on to that a bit at the end. Um, but that, that's just a couple of examples of the, of the World Cup guys and, and what they're working on. So... This might seem really confusing. Um, we're not going to spend an awful lot of time on it. Um, how, how can you break up a ski turn? Um, you know, you look up and you think, oh, how do you do that? So um, the Canadians break it up into eights. The Americans break it up into sixes. Uh, the French break it up into threes. And the Italians break it up into threes. So um, Tom, one of the other coaches, can't count to eight. So we've had to split it up to three as well. So... Um, no, we, we're going to keep it simple. Um, the, the turn, there's three phases to the turn. The load phase, maintain, release. You don't, you don't need to remember that. Three phases to the turn. Phase one is your rolling of the ankles. It, it's the rolling of the ankles and the pole plant in slalom, GS as well sometimes. Um, it's the rolling of the ankles to start that new turn. That's your phase one. So if you, if you had to imagine, if you look at the screen where that number two is, the gate is probably where my cursor is. Um, so phase one is always above the gate. Now, I remember last week, actually, we, we looked at a, a screenshot. There was six photographs of Paula Maltz, an American girl, who was running late in the line, and she missed the top of the turn and, and as a result, fell inside. It's so easy to finish one turn, and instead of rolling your ankles, you just go straight at the next gate and you miss out that top part of the turn. So it's the most important part of, um, of the turn, but it's also the most difficult to do. If you're going 50 miles an hour and you've got nine and a half meters to turn, rolling your ankles is extremely difficult. So that's why things like dry slope, um, the indoor domes are all really, really good for that. Um, so yeah, phase one, just rolling your ankles to, to start the turn. Nothing too difficult, okay? Phase two. That's a really good picture I got there up on the, the, the top left. Um, once you've rolled your ankles, phase two is the, is the main bulk phase of the turn. It's where the action happens. Um, so you roll your ankles in, in part one at the top of the turn. Once you, your skis start pointing down the line, what we call the fall line, um, for those who don't know, the fall line is when your skis are pointing directly down the hill. Um, that, that's the fall line. So phase two is when your knees go in, and you can see in the middle picture uh, and the photograph to the top right, actually, of, of Ollie Lachlan, one of the under-14s last year. Um, the shins are parallel, the knees go in, and the shoulders at the same time um, move across. So you've got phase one where you just roll your ankles, um, we're rolling phase two, the knees go in, and at the same time, that outside shoulder drops. Okay, so that's phase two. Um, again, if you don't remember this, it's really not the end of the world. Um, it, it's just a good way to think, okay, I'm going to split my turn to three, I'm going to roll, I'm going to put my knees in, and I'm just going to let the skis go. For example, Charlie Guest put this on our Instagram, I think yesterday or maybe the day before. Um, now, <laughs> this is awesome. Um, it is a just as a coach's dream. So the distance between the tips of her skis, her feet and her knees are the same. Her shins are parallel. Her hips are square. Her shoulders are square. Um, I mean, the only thing is she wouldn't be able to hold a football. We'll let her off. She's in the World Cup. Um, so th this is awesome. Now, to do that, free skiing is, is one thing. To do it in a course is a, a whole other ballpark. Um, so yeah, so far, phase one, 
rolling your ankles. Phase two is when the knees and the skis start going down the hill. And that's when the forces really start going. You drop that outside shoulder, okay? Phase three, I'll just give everyone one minute um, to have a read of this and then we'll, we'll get going again. Also, pinged is not a good word to use in any of your uh, English exams or your language tests or anything like that. Wouldn't, wouldn't recommend it. it doesn't, not not uh, understood by word. Um, so phase three is, it's almost like the reward. So if you've rolled your ankles, your knees have gone in and you've separated that separation, your outside shoulder goes down, you're going to get a serious bit of acceleration um, for, for all the other coaches on here and parents as well. You've got the buildup of pressure, the buildup of force, centrifugal force pushes down the way, it bends the ski. That's got to go somewhere. And if you can pull your shoulders and your hips forward, all that energy is going forward. It's going towards the next, uh, towards the next gate, above the next gate. So we, we call the phase three the transition, um, sometimes known as the glide phase. If you can see in the bottom picture, this is, this is someone in the transition. Um, their skis are flat. Therefore, they're really going. Um, flat skis or fast skis. Um, what, what's really important, especially in GS and Super G, um, and slalom to a certain extent, is when you finish the turn, you don't sit back and open up your shoulders. Okay, because I'm, I'm sure you can see the next picture already, but that's what happens if you do. So when you finish the turn, and everyone can do it, um, you just want to stand there and just roll your shoulders a couple of times. So you finish your turn and that's the movement that you're going to go towards that next turn or, or above the next gate. So you finish one turn and you roll those shoulders forward. If you open the shoulders up, that's when your skis shoot out from underneath you um, and you end up with a sore bump. So here you go. This is me again. Happened a lot. Um, I did finish one or two runs, but anyway, this happened regularly. So I finished the turn um, opened up my shoulders, and as a result of that, my skis shot from underneath me, um, and there's absolutely nothing you can do except for uh, trying to relax before you hit the deck. Um, so let's just, just very, very quickly, we'll go through the phases again. Three phases in the turn. The top phase, phase number one, is just you're rolling the ankles, it's the start of the turn. Phase two is when your skis begin to point down the hill, it's, it comes after phase one, funnily enough. You roll your knees in and that outside shoulder gets dropped. So that's your upper body and your separation. Phase three is your glide phase. It's the reward for doing the other two phases as well. So it's when you really round your shoulders off and you really push forward towards that next gate. Um, so that, that's what we're going to roll with. Um, again, every coach is different. Every team is different. That, that's what we do. That's what a lot of... Uh, a lot of guys in the World Cup do, and it's a lot of a lot of kind of youth um, teams are doing. So your, your local phase teams, your regional teams uh, in Europe. So that's the phases of the turn. Um, these three guys, we're going to move on to something else now. These three guys are all doing something in common. Um, what, what is it? It looks really weird. So the lady on the left, uh, Lanesberger, is having a seat. There are two guys. One guy's doing the front crawl, one guy's doing some press-ups, and uh, the guy on the right is getting some snow put down his back. So um, it all comes down to what, what they're doing. This is the top of the race, um, and they're all preparing for their runs in different ways. So Lanesberger, um, she, this, is what, this is her routine. I, I saw it the weekend, or last week. She puts her goggles on when there's two people before her. She keeps the salopettes on until there's four people before her and she doesn't put her skis on until there's three people before her. So that's her routine. Um, the guys in the middle, um, you've got, I think it's one of the, I can't see it, is at the top, um, doing his press-ups. 
the other guys are doing some movements, doing some stretches. Um, and then you've got Luca Deli Prandini on the right, who's getting some snow put down his back um, to kind of wake him up. And it just comes down to find something that works for you. Um, I remember the first time a coach put snow down the back of my neck um, and I, I, I just caught me by surprise. I, I was just, it was awful. So it, it comes down to what works for you um, and, uh, and what works, yeah, for you. For on race day, try it in training. Um, so next thing we're coming on to is, is what is this guy doing? So take 10 seconds um, or, or 15 seconds to speak amongst yourselves. If there's only one of you, have a cup of think. Um, what, what is he doing? If you know what he's doing, um, have you guys ever done it? All righty. So uh, one of the Austrian boys, Skin Slalom, and this is his way of visualizing the course. So he's probably got his eyes closed um, and he's just taking himself through the course. You know, he might not know every gate, you know, okay, turn at the top, quick hairpin, more rhythm, okay, vertically, then it rolls over. And, and this is his way of doing it. Everyone's different. Um, and what he'll do at the bottom of inspection, or he might, he might go away at the top and he'll just take two minutes on his own with no one else around him, <clears throat> no coaches, no nothing. Um, and that's his way of preparing for a race, his way of remembering the course or, or splitting up into sections or, or whatever works for him. Um, so on that subject, we're going to look at the cross block. Now, quite a technical point. Um, what is it? Why do you do it? Does it hurt? <laughs> Good question. Um, uh, and some, some tips and tricks for how to cross block. So what is a cross block? You can see in the picture. It's when you use the opposite hand um, to block the gate that's in front of you. It only happens in slalom. Um, well, why do people do it? It allows you to take a shorter line. So if this person wasn't cross blocking, the skis would have to be at least maybe half a meter further, out, further away from the gate, um, which if you put, you know, you put half a meter on 60 slalom gates that's an awful long way um does it hurt absolutely not you've got your shinies o only thing is if if athletes or kids are starting to cross block definitely worth getting a pair of shinies getting some pole guards uh, and most importantly getting a chin guard um so i don't know that, that's me on the right I, I don't know why i didn't have a chin guard on very bad mistake um it is a hundred percent um worth getting a chin guard pole guards chin guards that's all you need um, and it, it's, it's get going. So, yeah, cross blocking is now the modern day technique of slalom. Um, so a, a couple of tips and tricks when it comes to cross blocking, you'll often see it, and parents especially, you, you'll see people reaching for the gate. So you, you, someone will be coming down and they'll look like they're boxing the gate um, out, out in front of them. So how can we, how can we coach that? What, what can parents say? Excuse me. Or what can other athletes even say? So cross block low, it's a, it's a, a we, I mean, I, I say it probably too much. Um, if you cross block low, it automatically does so much for you. So the guy up in the top left is six foot eight, right? Guys who don't know what six foot eight is, it's probably double what, how tall you are. Um, he, he is massive. Um, so he's cross blocking on the writing. Now, if you look, so that's me cross blocking on the right in. I'm under six foot, he's six foot eight, and he cross blocks the same height as I do. So by doing that, you can see it pushes that inside knee in, and as a result, keeps his shins parallel. It keeps his shoulders level because if he was to cross block higher up, up here, his in, he'd have no option but for his inside shoulder to be dipped in. So it's a massive, massive coaching point for not only coaches, parents, other athletes, when you cross block, 99% of these slalom gates have got white writing on them, whether it's SPM, Liskey, uh, any other ones you get, Euro grip. Um, aim for that white writing or ask your coaches, can you get a permanent marker and can you just put, you know, can you color in black where you want me to cross block or 
can you get tip X out and colour in white where you want me to cross block? Because especially if you A, haven't been taught to cross block, if you're just getting into cross blocking or if you're growing, um, cross blocking is a, a massive, massive thing. Um, if you cross block well, you'd probably be three or four seconds a run faster than someone who cross blocks badly. So it's definitely a skill that's worth um, that, that's worth honing in on, speaking to your coaches about, um, and even ask them to demonstrate it. Um, ask them to, to show you how to do it. Um, show video. Um, you got, you know, if you're video, uh, skiing down, I say, okay, can you video me just so I can see where I'm cross blocking? And I guarantee you, when you look at the video, you think, I, I could have sworn I was cross blocking lower than that. You, you'll never cross block as low as you feel. Um, so another example, um, one of the young Swiss boys, he's six foot six, this guy. Swiss slalom team, team average height is six foot six. There's four of them. Um, so he's cross blocking on the right end. Now, if he's cross blocking on the right end and he's six foot six, five foot two of you guys are five foot four or five foot eight or even if he's six foot, Cross blocking on the right end is something that everybody can do from, you know, under 12s that are just beginning to cross block to the fizz guys that are, you know, just maybe looking at national teams or, or just trying to get better fizz points through to Europa Cup guys, right the way up to the World Cup guys to the, the best in the world. Um, it is just something that is a staple. It is the same for everybody. Um, so, yeah, really good coaching point. Um, and parents, you'll notice if people aren't doing it because they're, it's like they're boxing, it's like they're dancing. Um, and you can see when people reach, they get twisted. So if you ever see it, you know, don't be, don't be scared um, to say, oh, you know, I think you're, you're maybe reaching for the gate a little bit. Just try and remember, remember what we looked at. We're going to cross block a little bit lower. Um, I don't know how well that'll go down, but you know, give it, give it a shot and, uh, and see what happens. So three ladies, what have they got in common? They've got a lot. World Cup wins everything, but we mean in the pictures. Um, every single one of them is, or the one on the right would be, but she hit the gate with her knees first. Um, cross blocking low. If you look at Vlahova on the left, as a result of she's cross blocking really low, almost below the right end. Um, she's I think she's about five foot eight, five foot nine, um, and what it does is, it's it's one point, and as a result of it you tick so many other boxes. So you can't cross block low if your shoulders are leaning to the inside. You can't cross block low if your legs are too close to, if your feet are too close together. You can't cross block low if your feet are too wide apart. You can't cross block low if your knees are not doing the same thing. So really, really good coaching point um, for men, ladies under 12s, 14s, 16s, 18s, 21s, 30s, um, 50s, 90s, and, and the rest. So it's important to realize that these guys, they're not, they're not mere mortal. You, you guys are all doing it. Um, all doing it. Now, it, it takes practice. It, it definitely takes practice. Um, one thing that I actually forgot to mention is why. why. Why do we do it? So we've done that. Another reason is, now we can all practice this at, um, on the camps or, or next training sessions. If you put a gate in the ground and you punch the gate near the top, the gate might fall down, I don't know, half. If you punch the gate on the white writing with the same force, I guarantee you, I bet you 10 pounds to every person who tries it, the gate will hit the ground. Okay, so it's just physics. If you apply the force near the pivot point, it goes down a lot easier. So especially for you smaller guys that think, ah, oh, the gates are really heavy or, you know, I, I don't know if I've really got the confidence. It will really, really help you guys to, if you cross block lower. Um, just from a strength point of view. Um, so we can see in these, these photos, we've got Harvey. Um, we're under 16, he's cross-blocking low. We've got Blair, um, who is in, this is another really good example, phase one of the turn, because he's rolled his ankles, shoulders are level, and he's going to cross-block probably just the top of the white right. Um, so that, that's, that's absolute money there. Um, and GB George in the, in the top right, feet are a little bit close together, but he, he's a... Uh, uh, GB gymnast, we, we need to let him away with uh, just about what he can get away with. It's unbelievable. So, um, yeah, that's that. Video analysis. Ask your coaches, ask your parents. Um, can you video me this run and, and have a look at it? 
and and parents can identify it's a really simple thing for for parents to see so can you go too close to the gate i've used the wrong uh no i've not yeah you can um it's called blocking the line now i was going to use pictures of uh, athletes but i thought that would maybe be a bit harsh so yes blocking the line if you imagine you've rolled your ankles and you're about to put your knees in to the turn but the gate's there in gs especially you've got two options you can take the gate on your shins get two massive bruises across your shins maybe lose a couple of teeth might end up in the net or you can back off the turn and you'll have to skid it out so what's really really important and this is where your inspections come in is the line that you take so the two inch six inch example is a good one i remember i was training at helene in edinburgh on the dry slope and the, the coach said to me you're too close to the gates i said you're rubbish you're speaking rubbish and that, that shows how easy i was to coach for a start and um the he said no you're far too close you're two inches to the gate away from the gate you're inside uh, boot now he goes i want you to try and get six or eight inches away from each gate i said right okay so i did it a couple of runs later um, and it was a second faster run purely because I could move through the whole turn. It was one fluid motion of roll your ankles, the knees go in as the shoulders are dropped towards the outside. It's one fluid motion um, rather than roll your ankles, oh, the gate's coming, flinch, off you go and finish the turn. So that's where line, um, it's not necessary. That's why we said last or week two, I think it was, maybe week one. The straightest line is not always the fastest. If you can ski a line where you don't disrupt the ski and you can get the reaction out of the ski in the, in the third phase of transition and your skis can accelerate, that'll be so much faster than if you run a straight line from gate to gate, but you can't have a smooth turn because the gate's in the way. So the answer is yes. Um, you can't, more so in GS, um, definitely in Super G. If you get the line wrong in Super G, it's normally a sore one. But yes, you, you can go too close to the gate. So um, we're going to be done. Two slides left. Um, now this is this is cool. So we've got little Joshy is under ten, and we've got Luca Diallo Prandini, who's a uh, uh, world champs GS silver medalist. Um, now it's pretty cool. What do these guys do differently? The, the answer is nothing. Um, you know, look at the Aliprandini, rolls his skis at the top of the turn. He puts his knees in probably a tenth of a second after that, both together. Whilst he puts his knees in, he drops that outside shoulder. What does Josh do? What does Josh do? Under 10. He rolls his knees at the top of the turn. He rolls his ankles at the top of the turn. He puts his knees in at the same time. I sorry, he puts his knees in at the same time as his outside shoulder gets dropped. The only difference is that the World Cup guys are going a little bit faster. If you go faster, there's more forces you have to manage. They're a little bit heavier, generally speaking. Um, so the forces are um, bigger again. So you can see the size of uh, Diallo Prandini's legs. Th these guys put in hours and hours and hours in the off season from May or from April to kind of October, November. Um, they, they'll do eight sessions a week, five or six days a week, um, and during the season will very rarely lift. Um, the, the season is all about maintaining your fitness, whereas the off season, so from give or take April to October, November, is all about getting that base. So make sure your cardio is up there, you know, making sure you can ski 700 slalom gates a day, making sure your legs can take it, making sure you're mobile enough so that you can push your inside knee in. Um, so, yeah, th these guys in the World Cup are doing exactly what you guys are doing. Um, the same processes. If anything, you guys are probably ahead of them uh, at your age. Um, a lot of these guys, uh, you know, didn't start racing properly until they're under 14s. Um, and then after that, even that, the first four or five years when you get to fizz, so what, what happens is you... Finish your under 16s, you go into Fizz. What's Fizz? Fizz is basically everyone in the world. Um, so you can race in a Fizz race. It could be your first ever day as a Fizz athlete. 
Um, Great Britain will get given, I don't know, 10 spaces in a race. You go to the race. Anyone in the world with a fizz license can turn up to that race. So, for example, my first ever GS, um, or fizz GS, was in San Pellegrino. And it was Giuliano Razzoli that won it, uh, Olympic champion. It was uh, Tommy Sala was there. He was third. And the whole Italian World Cup team um, turned up to this race and, well, ruined it for the likes of me. But it was, it was awesome. And that just goes to show that once you hit fizz, it's a complete minefield. It is just, you're out there with your team um, and it's not going to be a case of, you know, oh, I'm going to do you know, a couple of weeks training then I'm just going to hammer these races. If, for these guys that get to the World Cup, you know, they're in fizz for, you know, 10, 15 years even. Dave, Dave Riding, um, for those of you that know fizz points, had 300 fizz points after six years in fizz. Um, so that, that's the equivalent of, uh, I don't know, um, the queen. If you put the queen right now on a pair of skis and said, okay, I need you to go down this GS course, probably the same as what Dave was after five years in fizz. Um, but because he's stuck at it uh, and he's gone through the motions and the coaching was good, he's now... I think he's what top 16 in the world. I think he was 12th. He's in the second draw. So, um, yeah, these, these World Cup guys are not doing anything differently to what you guys are doing. Um, so, yeah, last point, and this is a if, if it works for you, it works for you. If it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, excuse me. So, three boxes. I want you to imagine you're standing on your skis. Um, you're not doing a turn, you're just standing. With your skis and boots on, you can have your helmet on if you want. Um, the first box is going to be your skis. So it's the tips of your skis all the way to the tails. If you're to look down, that's that box. Okay, so that's box one, first box. The second box is from your feet to your hips. So literally draw a box. It goes up both your legs, across your hips, and across your feet. So that's your second box. And your third box is from your hips up. So, you know, rectangles. First one is your skis. Second one is from your boots to your hips. So it just goes up your legs. It's just a big rectangle. Um, I'm going to be trying to get some pictures for it next week. And the third one is your upper body. Now, if you've got a rectangle and you push one corner, it turns into a weird kind of diamondy looking shape. Um, I think it's a rhombus, but don't quote me on that. Um, so you, you, we don't want that. We don't want any... What we're looking for is perfect rectangles the distance if you look at a rectangle the distance between the first two lines and the bottom two lines where you parallel lines exactly the same with your skis that's exactly what we're looking for we're looking for a rectangle that's got the same distance at the top it's got the same distance in the middle between your feet and it's got the same distance at, at the tail so it's just one simple rectangle from your boots to your hips it's exactly the same thing that rectangle even if you roll your ankles and move across, the, the hips move, but the rectangle goes with it. So the rectangle, um, that, that box, if you want, stays exactly the same. Now, the easiest one probably is your upper body. Um, it goes from your hips, so you know where your hip bones are, up to your shoulders and across. And that, that's it. Um, you can add your top of your head in if you want. Um, and that is literally the, the three box theory, if you want. So if you can keep these boxes aligned, you're laughing. I mean, you're probably top 10 in the world for your age. Um, it's a really good way for, for coaches, for parents, and for athletes to think, you know, if you're free skiing, you can have a quick look down. Oh, hang on a minute there. My, my inside ski's way further forward than my outside ski. You need to square that box off. So I'm going to pull that one back. And then you have a look down again. You go, oh, nice. I, I've got that rectangle's going. Um, so might work for some of you. might not work. Um Give it a shot. Really good uh, tool for coaches and parents. Um, but again, we come to the most important point of the day. All comes with experience. Um, ask questions. Ask other athletes. Oh, what did you think of my, my run there? Or, or say, you know, you don't need to coach other athletes, but just say, oh, what, what, what are you working on there? And they might say, oh, I can't roll my ankle, so I'm really concentrating on rolling oh, I'm concentrating on rolling my ankles as well. Like, like, why don't we, you know, why don't you go half, stop, have a look at me, and then I'll, I'll watch you for the second half. So 
you know, work together. It's, it's a team, it's an individual sport, but it takes a team to get a result. Um, that's, a, that's actually a really good saying. I might write that down. So, um, yeah, individual sport takes a team to get a result. The, the guys in the World Cup know it. The younger guys know it. Everyone knows it. Um, you do you. I don't know where that's from, but I think I saw it um, maybe on social media. Know how you work. So if you, if you do you, you know that on a race day, you don't want to talk to anybody. You, you might be one of those people and you don't want to talk to anybody at all apart from two coaches, one in inspection and one in the start. Or you might be, you know, singing and dancing. You've got your headphones in at the start, you, you know, you're having a little jazz, um, just not even thinking in the slightest about ski racing um, until, you know, that 10-second that beep goes and you go, all right, me in the mountain, time to, time to get after it. Um, so, yeah, quick recap. Phases of the turn, uh, one, two, and three. Roll your ankles. After that, knees go in, parallel shins. Phase three is your reward. Um, it's when you let the skis go, but and the one condition is that your shoulders go with it. If you don't open up your shoulders, you end up like me, crashing all the time. So cross block low was the next point. Um, there's 99% of the time, a little bit of white writing on a, on a slalom gate. Um, go for it. That, that's where we're blocking. If you can aim for that every time, if there's no white writing, ask your coaches, can you put some you know, permanent marker, tip X? Um, they'll, they'll do it, no problem. Fighting for the platform, um, it's what distinguishes someone who is ranked 100,000 for their age in the world and someone who's ranked one in the world. Um, if you've got a, a desire to think after every turn, I'm going to be in that position where my feet are the same distance apart as my knees, where my shoulders are, are rolled over and my upper body is upright and I can roll into that next turn. If you've got a passion and a desire to do that 60 times in a row in a slalom, you, you, you're top 10 in the world for your age, 100%. Um, so, yeah, that, that's all we've got um, for tonight. I need to apologise again for not putting last week's on the uh, on the YouTube. Um, I'll do that just now. We've got two more sessions tomorrow. Uh, fitness session, sorry. We've got a live one on Sunday. Um, and I promise you I will put tonight's and last week's technical session um, on, what do you call it, on the YouTube. Um, we're going to run, yeah, like we said, one more next week. We'll go for another one, uh, week six, and then we'll knock it on the head after after week six. So thanks for your time again. We'll, we'll either see you Sunday tomorrow or uh, we'll, we'll see you next Wednesday. Cheers, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Fraser. Bye. Cheers, guys. Bye. Thank you, Fraser. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much, Fraser. Cheers, mate. Cheers, guys.